Okay, this is the wrong subject for you to justify your disagreement with me by suggesting I might be biased. That is the pick a different subject where I could be biased. Not this. I'm not one. saying you're biased. No. I'm saying that this is what I get when I'm in the public. I don't know what it is. Therefore, aliens. People I, do say that. They do very say few that. People. No, not few people. How many people do you interact with? Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist, an author, and a science communicator who is the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the Rose Center for Earth and Space in New York City. Neil also has a new book called The Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization, which is in the description. Today we talk about UFOs, artificial intelligence, and whether there's more to this world than the mere peregrinations of scientific application. It's a tough conversation to bring to you, and it's tough for several reasons. Number one, the subject matter itself tends to be contentious. Number two, the style of my questions and remarks tended to clash with Neil's. And number three, there are just miscommunications all around. Most of that's my fault, and I'll hopefully improve in the future as a result of this interview. Despite that, I absolutely loved the podcast. In fact, it's one of my favorites. I didn't want it to finish, and at no time was Neil upset with me, nor I with him. We clarified that twice. This is just how people disagree, usually behind the closed doors of the university, when attempting to discuss almost any topic in a scientific manner. My name is Kurt J. Mungle, and I have a podcast here called Theories of Everything, where I use my background in mathematical physics to analyze theories of everything, predominantly from a theoretical physics perspective, though I'm interested in other approaches as to what's fundamental. Is presentism correct? What about holism over reductionism? What about consciousness? Where does experience come into play? What ontological status does mathematics have? You can think of it as explorations of the largest mysteries of the universe without already having some defined position that I'm advocating for and trying to force the conversation in a contrived way toward it. At approximately the 20 to 30 minute mark, there will be a couple of ads. Those drastically help tow, as well as the patrons. You'll also get audio episodes like this ad-free and early. For instance, this episode was released a couple days ago, prior to it premiering on YouTube as a thank you to the patrons. So thank you to the sponsors and thank you to the patrons. If you'd like to support Theories of Everything, this podcast, then visit patreon.com slash Kurt Jaimungle. That's C-U-R-T-J-A-I-M-U-N. G-A-L, with a donation of whatever you like, it genuinely helps. It helps both financially as well as emotionally, that is motivationally, to know that there are other people like yourself who are willing to support a project like this, to bring it to other people, to thousands, to even millions of people at zero cost. That's super fantastic, so thank you, thank you to all the patrons, and thank you to you who are watching. Enjoy this podcast with the legendary Neil deGrasse Tyson. Firstly, you should know you're one of the people that got me interested in physics and science in general, along with Brian Green since I was a kid. So I have my career to thank you for. Wow. Okay. Good. My degree okay. to thank you for. So you turned out okay. <laughs> yeah. And my predilections as well. I wanted to firstly thank you for helping shape me. And secondly, welcome you to this podcast that in a sense you've helped shape and lay the foundation for several other people to be interested in science. So thank you and welcome. I'm delighted. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you working on these days and how is your day today, man? Oh, it was a busy day. Did some recordings for my podcast, a star talk podcast. And that, but we did those at the meta headquarters in New York. Um, meta based Facebook, basically, uh, they gave us some, uh, we're, we have some business relationships with them. So they, we, we so I was just down there and I learned that they have a, they have a floor it's called the sushi floor. So you go there and you have sushi and then another floor, they have hamburgers and another floor, they have milkshakes. And during their lunch hour, you just choose the floor where you're going to hang out. And then that's the food. I said, I want to, I want I want to work here. <laughs> Why don't they mix it? Why don't they just have one floor? There's too many options of sushi and hamburgers. Uh, maybe. Yeah. They're different, they're different stoke kitchen needs, of course. And so it's not just one cafeteria. It's it's food segregated. <laughs> I see, I see. But that's what restaurants are. They're food segregated zones, right? So uh you don't go to a, you don't go to a pizza shop and say I'd like sushi, or you don't go in a, a Indian restaurant and say I'd like the bratwurst, right? Or you just <laughs> or or pastrami sandwich. Yeah. We 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 know already know they're segregated. It's just cafeterias historically have been completely mixed or just have bad food in general. So these, this was all very well done. 
What fundamental aspect of our universe, let's say of our current understanding of our universe, do you think is most likely to change or be overturned in the near future and why? If it's fundamental, I don't think it'll change. So that's not how I think about what is fundamental. Um, the, there's the boundary between what we know and we don't know, and that'll change daily as, as our observations and experiments affirm what we thought was true and, or what we've concluded is true by repeated experiment. And it becomes part of our foundations of physics, of even of science in general. Uh, I don't see those changing. That's why they're foundations. They, they might be enclosed in a deeper understanding of the world as Newton's laws were when Einstein came along with Newton. Of course, we had our law of motion and law of gravity back when we call them laws. And of course you put low speeds and low gravity into Einstein's equations. They become Newton's equations. So we didn't discard Newton. We just learned it was a, it was a, a part of a larger, deeper objective truth in the universe. So no, I don't, I don't see if, if something is overthrown that we, somebody thought is fundamental, it, was, it wasn't fundamental to begin with. So uh, that's how I, that's how I see the universe. Okay. I'll give you an instance. An example would be locality. So I would like to talk about the recent Nobel prizes with regard to entanglement. And I want to mm -hmm. hear, Love it. can you explain the recent Nobel prize? And then what does it say about fundamental reality or our understanding of it? Well, if I remember the Nobel prize, I remember I, I folded it into a talk I gave back this past January, but I haven't thought about it since then. I think they got it based on their research of entanglement, but wasn't it in circuits or was it, um, I'm trying to remember the details, but it was, it did involve entanglement and with entanglement, you have what is effectively, uh, instantaneous action at a distance. If you want to even use the word action, uh, although it's probably shouldn't because action is associated with fields, the invocation of fields. But um, if you have two particles created together with complementary uh, quantum states, then you observe one, the, other, the, the wave function collapses instantaneously for both of them. What I like in recent, uh, I learned just a few months ago from Brian Green, good friend up at Columbia, uh, he told me, he updated me, because I don't track this daily the way he would, or it's certainly the way you would, that the virtual particles in the vacuum, which people like to think of as the vacuum energy, are, of course, popping in and out of existence, and they are surely entangled, okay? Because they're created together, and then they get destroyed together. And there was some thinking that these are wormholes of some kind. And these wormholes are therefore everywhere because the vacuum is everywhere. And if that's the case, why not then think of the very fabric of space and time as woven by the threads of wormholes of all of these entangled particles? And I thought that was, that was kind of cool. Because otherwise, no one's been talking about what is space-time made of, right? And that's not even who thinks of, about that. Maybe some people do, but it's not, it's not in the books. We just describe what it is rather than what it's made of. So I thought that was cool. I, I enjoyed that. But otherwise, I don't have a strong thoughts or opinions on it. Um, the idea that, that something can happen in two places um, that happens simultaneously... I don't, it just is. I don't judge the universe. I, if that's what it is, that's what it is. And that is then the reality. I don't, uh, I don't lose sleep over it. Have you heard of Chaitin's incompleteness theorem? No. Okay. My question was going to be. So who, who is, who is, Ch who is this person? Chaitin is one of the founders or at least popularizers of algorithmic information theory. There's this guy named Kalmogorov for complexity theory. If, mm -hmm. if you know about complexity but from, theory. From long yeah. ago. Paul McGraw, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I often invoked. Uh, there's, there's a Paul statistical test on data, 
that I, uh, it's got some other name hyphenated with it. Does somebody call Magorov? Wow. It's sure, been, sure. It's been like 30 years since I've, I could pull out one of my books when I. <laughs> well, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So tell tell it to me. I'm happy to hear it. Sure. Kalmogorov complexity means if you take a string, so just zeros and ones, let's say you give. I, oh, give no, no. You... I know the Kalmogorov complexity. It's the other guy. That's okay, what you okay, explain great. to me. I'll just quickly explain Kalmogorov complexity because it's required for this and just okay, go. for the audience. So let's say you have a string of 50 zeros. There's not much information there because I can describe that to you right now. I say, write 50 zeros. That's like, say, four words. And then you get out 50 digits. You can compress data downward. Mm -hmm. And then you could ask, well, are there strings for which you can't compress? Mm -hmm. The quickest way of compressing them is actually to just give you back the, the, the string itself. Yeah, very cool. The measure of the program length, the shortest program length required to produce a string is called the Kolmogorov complexity. Okay. Okay. So we have that. So now you can classify strings in terms of a number of complexity. It's almost like some physical systems you can classify by entropy, but this mm -hmm. is computer science. But it feels like it's a counterpart to it, right? Yeah. So Chafetz's incompleteness theorem says that if you have a formal system, there exists a number, which is uncomputable though. So it's some extremely large number, L, as usually is denoted by L such that there are strings who have complexity greater than that, but you'll never be able to prove that they have a complexity greater than L. So that's Chaitin's incompleteness theorem, and it sounds like Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. Okay, and so what's the, utili what's the utility of that? So that's debated, whether or not it's, <laughs> it has utility in computer science. But my question is, or my question was going to be, hey, given that people like Dyson and even Penrose, I believe, think that Gödel's incompleteness says something about reality or physics or the possibility of us having a toe, whether or not a toe exists, given that, okay, is there any implication for physics for Chaitin's incompleteness theorem? Okay, interesting. This is the first I've learned of that incompleteness theorem, so I don't have a fresh idea. And you can think of it as a variation of Barry's paradox. Like you've heard of this paradox that says, what is the shortest number that can't be described in 70 letters? Yeah, it's, that, it's that sentence. Yeah, that sentence alone is like 57 characters. So if you were to give that number, well, you could have described it with 57 characters right there. So it's like a variation of that. Mm -hmm, but I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, okay, does that have anything to do with physics? Oh, yeah. So, okay. So, so I, I'll tell you this. Um, I tend to be more practical minded than that. Those kinds of questions, of course, occupy philosophers on the edge of the nature of knowledge and, and the knowledge of nature. But I don't, at some level, I find them to be a distraction because I want to just build the next telescope and I want to observe the next kind of object that we've never seen or heard of before. I want better data on the origin of the universe. I want, so I have these, I have different, more practical questions that I want solved. And as my community of astrophysicists typically do, we, we pose questions that can be answered by the hardware of either the telescopes or the space probes, and this gives us our understanding of the universe. So the discovery that our galaxy is not alone in the universe by Hubble, 1926, that the universe is expanding, 1929, that we are made of chemical elements forged in the centers of stars, 1957, that quasars are galaxies with with runaway black holes in their center that was long earned over decades of research that weird galaxies are colliding galaxies all of this are actual discoveries we can talk about and to say what is the implications of these i don't know what those implications would be but they're not stopping us from continually making discoveries and i can tell you had we been distracted by those kinds of questions over the past century none of what we know about the universe would be known today. So I question its utility for the practical-minded scientists. I question even the value of those questions. Okay, I'm going to question the question. Okay. Since maybe the 30s or 40s, there's been a split in the scientific community for shut up and calculate. Like, forget about philosophy. Philosophy is for the philosophers. Let's just even have separate departments. There's just physics. If you want to know, in fact, I, I would, I would word, I agree with you, but I would word it differently. Okay. I would say, uh, it's not shut up and calculate. It's philosophers who were hanging out in their armchair, deducing what they could about the world 
we learned in the 20th century that most of the world does our senses do not have access to most of what we will discover in the world as the 20th century unfolded. We needed large telescopes. We needed particle accelerators. We needed probes of the universe that do not issue forth from your senses being invoked on the couch. Most of it. And so, so because quantum physics, modern physics, basically, post-classical physics is an era that the philosopher in the couch has no access to because the philosopher in the couch does not have a laboratory. And the laboratory became necessary in order to know the next thing that's going to happen. You're not going to deduce quantum tunneling. Somebody's got to make that measurement. Okay. So I claim not that it was shut up and calculate. It was philosophers. You're not useful to us anymore. Sorry. We're going to keep going in our direction, find something else to do. And there's, there's religious philosophy, there's ethical philosophy, there's political philosophy. There's no shortage of branches of philosophy, but philosophers in the driving seat with the physicists where it had been for centuries parted ways. That's how I see it. I don't see it as some commandment that came down from on high. I see it as a practical reality of the philosopher no longer being as useful as they once were to the physicists asking questions on the scientific frontier. That's my view of this. I, if you if that's flawed, let me know. But that's how I see it. So I see it as, since the 40s or so, trying to wrap one's head around with what's going on in quantum mechanics you was can't, so difficult. You can't wrap your head around it. So we just do it. That's my point. That's, that's my whole point. The, the world is that way. So we can say, let's deep, try to deep. Is it a multi-worlds? Is it a thing? Is Go ahead. But I'm still making experiments and I'm still deducing the nature of the world from those experiments. And those questions a philosopher might ask, I'm just saying, have not been as useful. By the way, the physicists themselves can think philosophically, and we all do all the time. I mean, we embrace as deep a thought as we can muster. So I'm not, I'm not making light of what it is to think philosophically about the world, but to go to school to be trained as a philosopher and then knock on the physicist's door, I haven't seen one contribute in the last century. I would go back to the 1920s, not even the 1940s. Okay, firstly, there's Norton's dome, which is a philosophical experiment. What is that? What is that? What is that dome? It shows that indeterminism is there even in classical mechanics. Okay. So, so that's a philosophical, uh, sorry, a thought experiment. That mm -hmm. is extremely interesting. And also... In what way did it affect the progress of physics? Did it? And when did it come out? And It's from 2003. Oh, so recent. Yeah. That's a recent thing. So... Did, did that get folded into some new science experiment and understanding? I mean, I, I'm just saying, go ahead. I'm not, I don't want to stop y'all from thinking that way, but I have planets to discover. I have moons to measure. I have ice geysers on, you know, there's stuff out there that I care about and I want to know about. It. And it makes headlines in the, you know, the black holes colliding. All right. This is, these are things. That so, by the way, in high school, um, we had I went to a geeky high school, and we had various journals. There's a biology journal, uh, conducted and run by students, a biology journal, a math journal, and a physics journal. Uh, there was also a poetry journal, but it was less. We, we were science geeks, not literary geeks, and some of the funnest times I've had were sitting, you know, chewing the fat during study break. Study hall, or was it a break, or were we supposed to be actually doing coursework? <laughs> but we would just we would just talk about some of the deepest issues of our understanding of the universe that we possibly could, and it was fun. It was, but not, but it didn't sum to anything, such as learning new ways to uh, compute differential equations, for example. So, um. But I, Norton's Dome, I hadn't heard of this. Can you tell me more about it? Neil deGrasse Tyson has been instrumental in bringing the mysteries of the cosmos to the public eye. And it's not just for his own enjoyment. When you open access, everyone benefits. 
In fact, increasing access and learning about a new area can benefit more than just your mind. It can benefit your wallet. Just ask today's sponsor, Masterworks, who've had over 750,000 users and over 750 million invested in more than 225 SEC qualified offerings. Masterworks is making the world of fine art investing accessible to everyone, democratizing an industry once guarded by the ultra wealthy. They're offering the everyday investor a chance to own a piece of invaluable artwork without needing millions. I mean museum art, like Warhol, Banksy, and Monet. Masterworks is that Higgs boson in your investment portfolio giving it mass. I mentioned potentially benefiting your wallet. Well, Masterworks has already handed back the net proceeds from over $45 million in sales. That's 13 sales so far, with five of those sales happening just since we talked about them in December. In fact, every painting to date has delivered a profit back to their investors. Now I hear you, Kurt, I'm no art aficionado. Is it truly that simple? Well, Masterworks breaks these paintings into shares through a well-architected process with the SEC. And if they're selling a painting you're invested in, you get a share of the profits. Feel the brushstrokes of fortune as three of their recent sales have painted the canvas with 10, 13, and 35% net returns. Now here's the thing, Masterworks has a wait list. However, because you're a Theories of Everything listener, you get to quantum leap over the wait list. Just click the link in the description. If you'd like to learn about the topics in this video, then a great place to start would be Brilliant. Brilliant has courses on gravitational physics, electricity and magnetism, quantum objects, even quantum mechanics with Sabine Hossenfelder. It's a place where even if you're entirely new to a subject, you can come to understand via bite-sized interactive learning experiences these esoteric topics that underlie modern physics. On the Theories of Everything channel, there's plenty of technical talk on extended supersymmetry and symplectic geometry, which underlie some attempts to unify gravity with other interactions. Also soon to come space-time metric engineering, symmetric teleparallel gravity, turn Simon modifications to general relativity, and a great place to ascertain the fundamentals of what was just said is brilliant. They even have courses on neural nets and statistics and sampling. Often, when I want to learn about a subject, I'll take courses even on those I feel like I've mastered, only for Brilliant to show me new ways of thinking about it. This happened with their course on knowledge and uncertainty, where information theory is taught and intuitive ways of thinking about the definition of entropy are shown to you. It's fruitful for me to know where certain unification attempts with gravity work and don't work, and Brilliant is a great place for me to patch up gaps in my knowledge, helping me conduct better podcasts and make more informed assessments. Visit brilliant.org slash toe, that's T-O-E, for 20% off your annual premium subscription. As usual, I recommend you don't stop before four lessons. You just have to get wet. You have to try it out. And I think you'll be greatly surprised at the ease at which you can now comprehend subjects you previously had a difficult time grokking. Um, but I, the Norton's Dome, I hadn't heard of this. Can you tell me more about it? Sure. So there's a way that you can set up a system such that a ball can roll to the top and then just stay there. Okay, so it's an extremely fragile system, but it can roll from any direction and just stay there. And there's a way you can set up the initial conditions and the differential equation such that if you roll it backward, so you run the time backward, if it's at the top, it will go in some direction, but which direction it goes is undetermined. So there's one way of getting around it where you say, okay, we have to have some Lifshitz constant. But what you talk about in classical physics, why is it undetermined? What, isn't it just, just a very high number? I mean, what? There's something uh, called a Lifshitz continuity condition, which forbids certain equations. But then it turns out that if you assume Lifshitz condition, it's akin to saying there is no indeterminacy to begin with. So you prove there is no indeterminacy by imposing that there is no indeterminacy. But if you remove that, you get configurations like Norton's Dome. So, so if I understand what you're saying, um, you can set up the system so that it rolls to the top in this highly, highly improbable state, right? Because it's a, it's the top of a, uh, um, every incremental movement in any direction will send it back down the hill. Correct. So yeah. there it is delicately balanced. Now you want to, we say roll the, roll the videotape backwards. Why doesn't it just go back the way it came? 
course it would, because you just rolled the tape backwards. No, because it could have gone up from any one of the directions. So that is to say that... Oh, you don't have information about how it got up there. No, no. no. Well, there are multiple ways you could have gotten up there. So in the same way, you just reverse time. You could say there are multiple paths you can go from this point forward. Okay. So in other words, you have indeterminacy. So why isn't there indeterminacy about knowing how it got up there in the first place? So you have indeterminacy on both sides. What it says is that if you have a mass that's at the top of a dome and it's frictionless and the dome is characterized by a certain curve, which needs to be defined specifically, then it's at rest at the top of the dome, but at any T that's non-negative, any time that's greater than zero, it can take off. Why is it? Why? Why is what you're describing to me asymmetric at all? So the point is that you just set up the system like that as a thought experiment in order to just put t equals minus t. Okay. It's just useful to set up the experiment like okay. that. Okay. So in that, what is the, okay, so fine. It's an interesting thought experiment. I like, nobody doesn't like thought experiments. Then of what utility is that to the practicing scientist, even if it is of high interest to the philosopher? It then makes you say, hey, if there's a classical system that is determined, that's not the case. There's also another philosopher, another quantum physicist. So we shouldn't say, if, if that's really true about the Norton Dome, then we shouldn't say classical physics is deterministic, right? Correct. I don't, okay. I, that, what does that change? I, I don't get it. It's fine. It's great, great result. Okay. Uh, so let's think about this in a couple of ways. So number one, what is physics? Like physics is understanding what reality is. So we have to put an asterisk on what reality is, because like, who the heck knows what reality is? But physicists are trying to understand what that is. Someone like Tim Maudlin would say, hey, which I agree with, and I never put in these words before, quantum theory is never talked about in university as a physicist. You'd learn quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. But he would say, a theory tells you what the heck you're dealing with. It talks about ontology. So there needs to be that component as well. What does Otherwise, it need to be if what we're doing still works? It needs to be to you, the philosopher, but to me, the practicing scientist that's building circuit boards based on a complete understanding of how quantum physics works. I don't need to know that. That doesn't mean I don't want to know it, but the search for that answer, if it distracts me from other progress I will make in this physical universe, and I'm a practicing scientist, that's how I'm going to choose my paths in that way. So yeah, quantum physics, who was it that said the day you understand quantum physics is the day you can be certain you don't because you, it's not, there are variations on that. our native senses to, to interpret and yeah. okay. So that's one view. You can just take the view that, Hey, whatever is useful, let me just build something with it. Yeah, and that's how I think of physics. That's how I think of physics. Physics yeah. is, is. Matter, motion, and energy, and, and every way that allows me to predict the future of those systems so that I can exploit it to the benefit of civilization and, and intellectual pursuit. That's how I think of physics. Okay, so there's a couple of points there. Number one, there's a value in there, which isn't derivable from the physical facts. B what do you mean a value? What do you mean? I, just, I like it. Because you want to do something that's good. You want to do something useful. So you're not just doing anything. No, no, I didn't say useful. I don't. Did I say useful? Let me give a different word. Um, let me be more precise. Sure. And less precise at the same time. Um, I'd like to know ever more about how the universe works, so that I can invoke it in the progress of civilization. And by progress, I mean uh, new understandings. The history of this exercise often hardly ever doesn't convert to new inventions, new means of living, uh, to pr prolong our, our uh, benefits to our health, our longevity, uh, and just our enlightenment about how the universe works. So that's, that's how I think of physics. And it, at the more, most fundamental level, with chemistry layered on that, and then biology layered on top of that. I think that's an unfair characterization of how physics developed and even develops to this day. Now, as for modern examples, okay, let's put that aside. But what makes I, it unfair? What makes it unfair? Well, Einstein thought plenty about Mach's principle. And Einstein mm -hmm. also thought about other philosophical positions. Oh, by the way, Mach's principle was a philosopher from the 19th, the, the 19th century. Not So that that's pre the era that I'm describing here in terms of the value and influence of philosophers in the thinking of a modern physicist 
who's doing actual making actual discoveries. So, so you can mention mock and I'll give you mock, but there's not much after mock that you can cite. Yeah, but go on. Mm -hmm. John Bell of the Bell's theorems that we just mm -hmm. mentioned or the Bell's inequalities of mm -hmm. Nobel prize. He was influenced. Yeah, yeah, but, but John Bell, great question to you. Um, was he trained as a philosopher or as a physicist? That's kind of my point here. I, I think he was trained as a physicist. And so, um, and not, not to be pedantic about it, but it's the value of learning how the physical universe works with laboratories, okay, relative to armchairs. That's really what I'm getting at here. But sure, it's great. The Bell's inequality theorem is very important, very thought provoking, as any good philosophical conclusion should be. Yeah. So I think we're speaking past one another. So let me be precise because mm -hmm. I don't want to get misconstrued. What I'm saying is that physics benefits from an understanding of philosophy. And also, it did, especially physical statements by a physicist have embedded in them philosophical assumptions. So yes, if we do. say something about material, there's like materialism is in there. What is that? What is a material? Can we define it specifically? Musings, like actually sitting and thinking about what the heck exists. What is the nature of this? What is space-time? You mentioned that this is something we don't talk about much. Actually, there's several people who think that space-time is something that's emergent. And so they deeply, they think about, well, are we on the boundary? Are we in the bulk? Is it discrete? Is it not? What does that mean? Is it real? Does it have a variable associated with it, like there before we measure yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I got you. A, a characteristic, a thing. Yeah, yeah. That's all, all good. Does our consciousness have something to do with it? There's like 30 interpretations of quantum mechanics. Maybe four of them have to do with consciousness. But still, those are all... Oh, by the way, since we actually really don't understand consciousness, and the evidence that we don't understand it is that people keep writing books on it, all right, claiming they know it. That's the evidence that we don't know anything about. To take consciousness, about which we know very little, to explain something in quantum physics, or to have quantum physics, an understanding of quantum physics that nobody has, commingle with consciousness feels like very tentative land to stand on to take two things that are not deeply understood and use one to explain the other i i i'm i'm, I'm disturbed when i see people do that not just that overstates it i'm i'm intrigued that people have the urge to do it but i've make sure i do not ever have the urge to explain something i don't understand with something else i don't understand I don't think that's the wisest path to be on. It's a fun path, like over beer, sure. But to commit your life to it, I, I don't I don't know. I would question that. Relative to having applying that same brain power in other ways. Now, you mentioned other things like uh materialism, okay. Um that of course physics, so modern science, especially Western science, is highly materialistic. I mean, it's in, in fact almost entirely materialistic uh i don't know any other uh i don't think there's any dimension of spiritualism if we take that as the opposite of materialism i don't know any dimension of spirit spiritualism in traditional western science so you said how do we define materialism is that a problem how to define that is this a challenge is this really something people are distracted by I wouldn't put the term distracted with anything that's a philosophical investigation mm -hmm. because of reasons, like I mentioned before, physicists are steeped in philosophy, even if they don't know it. And this is a point Carlo Rovelli, Lee Smolin, I'm sure you know them. I've met Lee and I know Lee I, and I only know, of course, of uh, Rovelli's books. Carlo Rovelli and Lee Smolin, as well as this guy named Abai Ashtakar, are the founders of loop quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. This is also something that Abai Ashtakar says. He makes a great analogy. So if you have a sphere, you have to cover it with two open sets. You can't just cover it with one. Otherwise, you distort it. So what if reality is like that, where you need multiple covers? And the physical world, the material world, is just one of these open sets, but it doesn't cover everything. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There's an internal world, and it doesn't have to be spiritual. Like, well, you can call spiritual something associated with, yes. It's just a different world. It's different. You just, just call it different. Right. Very cool. It could just be different, whatever that different is. Yes, yes. Right. And he uh -huh. would say that... He has investigated some of that via his inner world. He calls one the inner versus the outer. I love it. <laughs> I don't know if it's as simple as there are two. Maybe there's a plethora. Anyhow. 
Uh huh. No, I love it. But of course, uh, Rovelli and and um, Lee Smolin have degrees in physics. Okay, so um, most of the philosophers of physics are trained in physics. This is my whole point. This is <laughs> that's my entire point here. Okay, you mischaracterized it by by thinking that I met, and I said I thought I spent at least ninety seconds saying that um, we we love thinking philosophically about things in our field, but training yourself to get a PhD in philosophy in the twentieth century has shown to be not so helpful to the moving frontier of physics. That doesn't mean the physicists are not thinking philosophically. So in the example. In the example you gave, yeah, they're thinking philosophically. Yeah, and they're physicists. This, this is my only point I, I, I was making when you brought up the subject. Again, it's a bit unfair. For instance, there's Hugh Price, who doesn't have a single degree in physics and has made significant contributions to the philosophy of physics. Secondly, there's a quote from John Bias asking, can philosophers contribute to reconciling general relativity and quantum field theory, which is this very topic we're talking about. Neil, and he concludes something like, to dare to imagine a world more strange or more beautiful is a daunting task where philosophical reflection is bound to be of help. And I'll leave the quotes on screen as well as I can send them to you if I find them because Carlo Rovelli echoes something similar. And additionally, if you want an ancient instance, I can give one of the major classical examples. It's Aristotle, so a philosopher. Wait, 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 no, no, no. you're changing the subject. I told you that, uh, sorry. I agreed with you that philosophy and physics were, in, you go far enough back, they were indistinguishable, all right? And they were neck and neck, and they're each a seat at the table, each with a steering wheel, together until modern physics. So if your best examples are from the classical era, I agree with you. That's, the, that's where you're going to have to go to get the best examples. My, the schism that I'm describing, which you originally described as shut up and calculate, which I put some nuance on that. I didn't disagree so much as add 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 some texture to that. That um, if you don't have modern examples, then that's the only point I'm making. Of course, there are classical examples. Right from Leibniz, you know, all and he had he trained in philosophy, not even in mathematics. Okay, he was uh, he's a philosopher, and so I don't have a, any issues with you. Going before the era of modern, it's modern physics that, as far as I can read, my read of history, that changed everything. You can't just sit down and think about anything anymore. You can't. You can't tell me the nature of quasars. You can't, because you don't know what they are. You, you haven't seen the observations. You don't know the spectra. You don't know what black holes look like that enabled us to connect. You don't know any of that. That, 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 that occupied thousands of research papers from the 1960s into the 1970s and early 1980s, just trying to understand what that phenomenon was. There was not a philosopher to be found. Would have been nice uh, if it could have worked that way. A lot of brain power invested in modern philosophy, no doubt about it. Some of the smartest people that ever were became philosophers. But I, I just don't see them at the table anymore. There's a seat there for you. I'm not rejecting you, but say something that'll help me figure out the universe. And that I just had, I don't see examples of it. And maybe I'm missing something. Okay. By the way, did you find out whether Bell was trained in physics? Bell is trained in physics. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. So I'm not making the case that people, I think you think that I'm making the case that I think that I think <laughs> you're making the case that you're not. <laughs> You think that I think that you think? <laughs> yeah, let's just clear the air. I'm not saying that a philosopher who's disembroiled from physics can make contributions to physics, though I'm not saying the opposite, because I do think that's the case, and I think that's historically the case. And I also think that many of what we think of as true is built on so much that's false, and we only realize it's false from the ill-formed, ambiguous statements that we try to make sense of. Do you have a, a, a recent example, recent in like the last 70 years of that? So the whole problem of, the hard problem of consciousness that's a philosophical question. Yes, and that's physiology and, and, and neuroscience. And the neuroscientists have philosophers right at their doorsteps, as where they should be. That's a brand new nascent field. Nobody, we, we still barely know anything about our brains. And so philosophers are there. Sure, that's where they belong, where they should be, as where philosophers were at the dawn of physics and, and the dawn of astronomy. 
and the dawn of almost any field has a nice set of philosophers helping out. Okay, number one, there's this statement, like, what problem has ever been solved by philosophy? I didn't ask that, but go on. No, 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 I know. I'm just saying, like, this Mm -hmm. is something to think about. Then you realize, okay, anytime anything's been solved by philosophy, it then moves into another field. And so all that remains are the hard problems in philosophy. And it looks like philosophy hasn't solved anything, but we don't realize that, oh, okay, it started it in this direction. And then they just let it go and it's no longer a part of philosophy. So that's number one. And number two, the primary reason for saying the hard problem exists is that the neuroscientist can just come up with neural correlates. And it's not clear. How do you get from those correlates to the conscious experience? Of course. So even though there's neuroscientists, what I'm saying is that it's spurred work. And the work, there's a whole field that's been developed because, not a whole field, there's a flourish of enthusiasm for a field because of the hard problem of consciousness being explicated by a philosopher. I agree. I agree. It's just not physics. <laughs> I agree. I'm saying there's, and there's, there's good moral philosophy that's come out recently. Good thinking, you know, that picks up some where some earlier moral philosophers had left off. Uh, plenty of stuff, including the mind. Yes. I got no issues there. That was never an argument for me. By the way, I'm, I'm intrigued by this. The, the uh, I don't, what's the word? Not cladding of the sphere. What's the, the two parts of a sphere? What's it called? Covering? It's an open cover. Open cover. An open cover, right. Uh, I just like that that thought. That, that's a fun thought. What what's What is it that is outside of our experience? Yeah, uh, so that's mm-hmm. something else that, that's fun to think about, is what are the limitations of the scientific method? And this isn't to be anti-science at all. Can I, can I respond it, to that? Sure. Uh, the way the scientific method is typically explicated can lead to that very question. But I, when I think of the scientific method, I think of it differently in a way that wouldn't even lead to that question. Okay. Here is Neil deGrasse Tyson's definition of the scientific method. All right. Do whatever it takes to not fool yourself into thinking something is true. That is not, or that something is not true. That is. Did I say that the right way and the opposite? <laughs> Whatever it takes. Oh, you know, I, I, I have delusions sometimes. So let me write down or get a video. Uh, I have certain biases. So let me have someone else check it. Um, I saw this happen, but maybe I should get a video of it. So all of these are tactics, methods, and tools to separate the data you collect on the physical universe from its interaction with your senses to minimize what role your senses play in the data. And science, modern science, as we know it, did not take off until we had, until we started to assemble, take off as in accelerate, until we assembled tool that replaced our senses with the near simultaneous, uh, with the near simultaneous invention of the microscope and the telescope, we were off and running in both directions. Lee Wen Hoke sees animacules, little animals swimming a prettily, to quote him, in a in pond water. Whoa, who ordered that? What's what's that? Galileo looks up and he sees spots on the sun, and so, so the the beginnings of rings of Saturn. Didn't know what he was looking at. Also, tools assisting our senses and ideally replacing our senses. There it is. So, to say. To now ask philosophically, what limits are there? I'm just trying to, the limit would be, what, what's the limit? Um, I'm unable to remove my bias from the data in any way at all, even by getting other people to re- review it. That would be a limit. If every person I got to peer review my work has exactly the same bias as I do, then something slips through the system that I think is true that is not. That's a limit of the system, but that's not founded in any philosophical uh, principle. That's just, that's bad luck in that case. So no, I'm not hypothesis pet. No, I'm not that precise about it. It's very blunt. Is there any hypothesis or statement or fact that can't be determined by science? By the scientific method? I, I am not prepared to say, how did you word it? Is it 
do, do I say yes to that or no? Do, repeat. <laughs> is there a statement? Is there a fact? A thing. Okay, yeah. That cannot yeah. be shown to be true or a hypothesis that can't be tested by the scientific method? I am not prepared to declare that something cannot ultimately succumb to the methods and tools of science. I'm not prepared to do that. Only because the history of that exercise leads is, is one of abject failure. Failure in the sense that science will never know this, or science, we can never know that. We And science slowly marches along and then checks those boxes, okay, as we move forward. Given the successful history of this enterprise, I am not here to tell you, standing here flat-footed, that, and I actually do have flat feet, <laughs> that, that uh, there's, a, there's a boundary beyond which science cannot reach. I'm not, I don't see evidence in the history of science sufficient enough for me to even make that claim today. What's your opinion on the recent UFO whistleblower, David Grush? I'm sure you've heard some whispers or maybe you've watched it yourself. Yeah, I'm not interested in testimonies. I mean, I, testimonies are the lowest form of evidence in science. I, I, it's, I don't care what you said you saw. I mean, I care, but I'm not, I'm not going to base an entire understanding of the universe based on what comes out of your mouth. And I don't care who you are, or what your rank is. It doesn't matter. Are you human? That's all I care about. You're human. I'm going to, I need something, I need something better than that. Like, show, bring an alien into the open square. How about that? Uh, we have six billion smartphones in the world. Give me some video of people getting abducted onto an, a flying saucer. That would that would go viral overnight. Cat videos go viral. You know that'll go viral. All right. I'm thinking if we're being invaded by aliens, we would not need congressional hearings to establish that fact. Really, the aliens are coming, and they're only going to restricted military airspace. Really. That how that's working? We have a million people airborne at any given moment with a window looking out into Earth's atmosphere. Have you ever seen the crisscrossing of our commercial air flights in the world in a 24-hour period? It seems to me if aliens are coming, we could crowdsource that. Oh, yeah. So I don't, I can't be impressed by testimonies at all. They can be intriguing. They could be reason to investigate further. Exactly. Okay, fine. There's something we don't understand. There are lights. You're for investigating further. At, I, there's a percent of a budget that I would say, um, put this tiny amount in this subject, which might pay off great returns afterwards. Yes. Okay. So, so yeah, I don't have a problem. When the, if the, 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 the Pentagon has a, a budget for, to study a phenomenon it doesn't understand, I mean, they're tasked with protecting us. There's something in the sky they don't understand. I'd, I'd hope they figure it out. <laughs> but the, pe the Pentagon doesn't have as full photographic access to Earth's, to the world as the 8 billion residents do and the 6 billion smartphones. So, uh, and by the way, little facts like in the 1960s and 70s, abduction stories were common. Oh, the aliens brought me on and they poked my gonads and things. But now that we all have smartphones, um, those stories have gone away because you could record it. All right. You could live stream it as the alien walked towards you or as they gathered. Uh, right? But that we don't see any such footage of that. We're not relying on your eye, brain, memory, sensory interaction with the world. And as I said earlier, we didn't begin to truly understand this world until we could bring methods and tools and tactics and especially instruments of measurement to the natural world that transcended our biological form, our biological sensory system. So whistleblower has, you know, we all turn heads when we hear about a whistleblower. All right. But I'm just saying if aliens visited, why would the government be the only agency that has them? Like, like why? Just why? Ask a whole other set of questions that no one's asking. If we're being visited, how come only the government knows about it? And have you ever well, Neil? Okay, hold worked on. for the government? Do you realize how incompetent the government Let actually me. is? That does anyone actually know this? That they could actually stockpile aliens and no one would know? Okay, I feel as if you're digging yourself into a hole 
and I love you, Neil. I love you, and I'm reaching out. Firstly, you're an alien. That's you're gonna say <laughs> that'd be great. I'm not anti. Who everybody wants to meet the aliens. I got nothing okay. against aliens. I love me some aliens. Okay, go on. So, firstly, there are several, maybe even hundreds, of commercial airline pilots who report seeing similar objects. And by the way, it's not the jump. Like I've heard it explained. There's the jump, unidentified, therefore aliens. To me, that betrays that someone hasn't studied this much because the claim isn't that it's aliens. In day two investigations into this, people call it the phenomenon. Yeah, sure. I, I, but, and I don't have a problem. I told you, you're arguing about against something that I didn't even have an argument about. Yes, if there's something in the sky that we don't know what it is, and we have eyewitness testimony or any kind of testimony, or it's on your chart recorder, and we don't know what it is, figure out what it is. I don't have any problems with that. And I said I'd allocate money to it if I would control it. Pentagon already allocates money. I don't have a problem with that. So what are you saying back to me when I already said I don't have a problem with that? Let me figure out how to phrase this. Do you see the sentiment in the public of people who take this phenomenon seriously, whatever that is, I don't know what to call it, ufologists, people who are interested in UFOs, they don't have to be believers because what are they believing in? They don't, they don't know. It's just something extraordinary. Right. Okay. They just, they like lights in the sky. Okay. It's fine. Do you get the sense that the sentiment is that you have a derisive, maybe even scornful attitude? No, toward this? I don't. I, I do. If you want to think they're aliens, but to the fact that there's something that can't be explained, the, the universe brims with mysteries. Sure. Go right ahead. Investigate it. No. The scorn is, I don't know what it is, therefore it's visiting aliens and it's a government cover-up. That's where I have scorn. It's, scorn is too harsh. That's where I don't have the patience for that. Because, it, because my sense of it is that if they were aliens, they wouldn't be as elusive as people are saying. They would just be in plain sight. There they'd be. And you wouldn't need to invoke a cover-up theory. A, a, a what's the term? Not cover-up. Um, conspiracy. A consp you wouldn't, wouldn't need to invoke a conspiracy. Because what is a conspiracy th theorist? It's someone who's pretty sure they know what's true. And where there's a gap in the data that would demonstrate it's true, they say it's missing because it's a cover-up. That's a conspiracy theorist. So those people that you're describing, not the ones that just see stuff they can't explain, the ones that see stuff they can't explain are sure they're aliens and sure the government knows about it, and but they can't prove it because it's a cover-up. Those are the ones I have issues with. Now, if you don't ha have issues with it, you're an educated person, if you don't have issues with those who are sure they're aliens, they need smart people on their side because I'm not among them. Okay, let's disentangle this. Firstly, the government is incompetent. I think the government's incompetent is both underestimated and overestimated. That's a cog in a wheel. That's, that's I'm saying, let me not say the government is incompetent because we can land a, a, a spacecraft on, on a moving target on Mars in a crater, you know, 70 yeah, million miles away. So let me not say incompetent. Let me just say the capacity of the U.S. government to keep a secret, which is particularly tasty, is essentially zero. I don't think the claim is that they have kept the secret, though, Neil. And, and so the government is not as competent as that in that as you think they are. Now, what do I base that on? What do I base that on? If there's a janitor, a janitor working in Area 51, and they're stockpiling aliens there, the janitor could smuggle in a smartphone, get a picture, upload it to the internet, the janitor would get fired the next day, and it'd be the richest, most famous janitor there ever was. Okay? Okay, and, no one would, firstly, no one- And if it's a cover-up, hundreds and thousands of people would have to keep secrets. That you, who's, who is it that said, you're a philosopher, you know that somebody said, um, was it Mark Twain? Oh, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, no, 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 it was, it, you like thinking philosophically. It was, it was Benjamin Franklin, one of these thinkers of centuries ago, said, uh, the only way two people can keep a secret is if one of them is dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or three people can see, keep a secret, two of them are dead. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So number one, I don't think the government has kept it a secret. I contest that because several millions of people believe that the government is hiding something. There are whistleblowers like we just talked about who've come out, several of them, like Lou Elizondo, there's David Grush. 
I'm sure there's more. Then there are also other programs that the government has kept secret. I don't think it's as easy to sneak in a smartphone as, as you may think, like with the NSA back then. And it should be much mm -hmm. easier now for information to come out. Existence of the NSA wasn't revealed until years later. And then the extent of which what they were doing wasn't revealed until mm -hmm. decades later. And then there's MK Ultra. Then there's also the fact that when you petition with FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests. So, so where are you go, what's, where are you going at, going with here? I'm just saying, I, I'm not convinced they're aliens. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying they're not lights in the sky we can't explain. I'm saying, I, and I'm not, I don't have the interest to spend my professional life investigating them on the premise that they're aliens. I, by the way, NASA and my field have been searching for aliens for decades. It's not that we don't care about aliens. We have the entire SETI program, for goodness sake. And it's been going strong with fits and starts since the 1970s. We sent signals in the 1960s out of the Arecibo telescope to a, a, a cluster of stars called M, the Hercules Globular Cluster M13. I think that was the cluster. Um, so it's not like we're not interested in aliens. Of course we are. But whistleblower testimony of what someone says they saw I don't count that as science. Not science enough to redirect my career to investigate it as aliens. Let somebody else investigate it for what it is. Is it a threat to us? Is it not? Is it a glitch in the detector? Is it anything else? By all means, check it out. So the proposition isn't, Neo, please, you must change your career now, given this. The proposition also isn't that testimony is the same as science. The proposition is that there is no smoking gun. And the smoking gun type of evidence isn't the only type of evidence. It is if you're making an extraordinary claim. If you're making, oh, the sun, I saw the sun rise this morning. You know, I don't need that much evidence from you to, to agree with your statement. Okay? I, don't, I really don't because I would expect that to be true based on everything I know of the natural world. So there are many cases where smoking gun is not important. We infer the existence of exoplanets without ever having seen one. All right, of the 5,000 exoplanets, uh, what, 35, uh, uh, 4,500 of them are inferred by the movement of the host star? No, half maybe. I don't know the latest numbers. There's a mixture of how we discover them. At least half are discovered by their gravitational effect on the host star. And we deduce the mass, the period, the thing, without ever even seeing them. All right, because we're not making a claim of something that's defying laws of physics or what we think might show up a, a dozen other ways. So smoking guns do matter depending on what kind of claim you're making. They do. Okay, so let's say you encountered something that was extraordinary. Sure. What do you do? I'm trying, I will try to get extraordinary evidence in support of it. Yes, that's instantly. That's what I would do. If I saw aliens walking, I'd pull out my smartphone, I'd, I'd find a video, I would um, try to steal something off their hip <laughs> so I'd have an artifact. I would, oh my gosh, I'd, I'd yell to other people, get images of the same thing. That's what I would do. I wouldn't just say, this is interesting. Now let me go to Congress and tell everyone that I had an encounter with aliens. No, I wouldn't expect anybody, any of my colleagues to believe me, even if it were true. I would be seeking the kind of evidence that extraordinary claims require. And that's extraordinary evidence. Let's say you saw some orb. Mm -hmm. And perhaps even you saw an alien. Perhaps even it abducted you. It didn't let you take out your... It didn't even occur to you. Because, by the way, this is a common experience with anyone. It's not just related to aliens. Firstly, it's difficult to get a photo of anything that's in the sky with your cell phone when you don't know where it is. I was walking in the woods with my family and there was a porcupine up in the tree. And then my... I didn't know they climbed trees. They climbed trees? Oh, that's dangerous. And we said, well, wow, whoa. Whoa, oh my gosh. Oh my god. Firstly, we're just startled. And so our system too, the I don't like that phrase. But I don't think porcupines climb trees, but go on. Okay. Anyway, go there's on. a porcupine in the tree. And it didn't occur to any of us to take out our phones. And further, like five seconds later or ten seconds later, it's just gone. And that's a porcupine. Like try finding a non-professional photographer's photo of a porcupine online. I did a search for that. Same with lemurs. And there are many lemurs and porcupines. I think there's twenty thousand times more lemurs and porcupines, maybe 100,000 times, then there would be these anomalous objects, whatever they are. So it's hard. Yeah, the science is hard. Secondly, 
even when there are images? Whatever it is, it's easier than detecting the gravitational wave from colliding black holes. And thirdly, there <laughs> does exist, while there doesn't exist great photos, and by the way, that's contested because the government seems to have some photos that they won't release, which is why... That's called a conspiracy theory, doesn't it? That's what that sounds like, but go on. They come from FOIA requests. Like, you can ask the government, what do you have? And then they can tell you the reason why they're not going to give it to you. Like, this is classified. This violates okay. this law. Of course it's going to have classified... What are you trying to... Where are you getting at here with this conversation? Neil, this can get to such traumatic events that people go through. Like, they get... You can imagine. I'm not even going to say it because it's on YouTube and maybe they'll get censored. They have no evidence. And someone could just say, why didn't you record? Weren't you in the right state of mind? And then let's imagine they have people testifying for them, people. Then we say, hey, it's in crescent evidence. So it's evidence that increases your credence by a bit. Yeah. No, no, it's not about credence. It's not a matter of credence. It's, it's eyewitness testimony gathered that's consistent, says, this is excellent. Now we need to bring the methods and tools of science to investigate this. Yes, I agree. I okay. agree. So that's Which what- Which would include pulling your damn smartphone out and not being shocked at the porcupine in the tree, which might not have even been a porcupine because I didn't know porcupines climb trees. You might've been seeing something else and thought it was a porcupine. Okay. Well, how would a, do porcupines climb? Really? Really? They, they, they got stubby little legs. How are they going to climb a tree? Yes, they regularly climb trees in search uh, of food. That's new to me. Yeah. Okay. So take that. It's new to you. Like, don't that's mean such like, hey, that's I great. don't know it. Therefore, it's not true. I didn't say that. No, no. How, no, you keep putting words in my mouth. Why you you're trying to characterize what I say to make your argument look good, and that's not what I've been saying. No, no. Quote me accurately before you criticize what I say, rather than reshape it so that you can make a comment that sounds like I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, I was being facetious, and I thought that that was clear. Okay, <laughs> but also the same is being done with you. I say you're strawmanning people by saying I don't know what it is, therefore aliens. People I do say that. They do so very say few that. People. No, not few people. How many people do you interact with daily? I do. And I, I have I have comment threads. There's a whole what now what percent? Half, maybe? I, I'm I, I, half will say that I saw a UFO. It did things that defy the laws of physics. It must have been an alien. That is one of the most common accounts for lights in the sky. That defi they say, and then it zipped away faster than any airplane. It must have been an alien. Do, do, do you realize how common that is? And I'm saying, we don't know what it is. It's fascinating. Let's investigate further. Go right Yes, ahead. yes. Great, great. I like that last part. I'm not quite a fan of the first part because even if that's What's the, the first case, part? It's saying that like 50% of people say, I've seen something. It didn't. That's my, that's my very loose. <laughs> That's my loose statistics on it that. It doesn't matter yeah. if it's 70%, which I actually think is maybe 25, but it doesn't matter. Okay, okay. It's not 1%, it's not 99%. Yeah, right. sure, okay. sure. The issue is that we are supposed to deal with the strongest argument. We don't take the case of even if it's the majority of people. No, the strongest argument would be actual scientific data, not eyewitness testimony. I have some notes here. Sure, go. This comes from Kevin Knuth. So basically he's saying that, look... I have papers. Kevin Knuth is a professor of physics, by the way, and the editor-in-chief of Entropy Journal and MD. Yeah, I, I actually don't care about people's pedigree. If they're right, they're right, regardless of their pedigree. And if they're wrong, they're wrong, regardless of their pedigree. Thank you for telling me that, but don't invoke that as some measure of whether or not what he's saying is more true than someone else's account. Go. Okay, I wouldn't invoke that ordinarily, except Neil. Okay. <laughs> Do you realize in my field, but just to be clear, in my field, when we publish papers, the you the your degrees are not listed next to your name. They're just names. And in that name could be an undergraduate who is particularly talented, who contributed their creative ideas to the research paper. We do not rank people when you're making the publication because a great idea can come from anywhere and can be tested and experimented. Okay, so go. I wholeheartedly agree. The reason why I had said that is because earlier... You made a distinction between those who are physicists and have gotten degrees in physics versus those who are philosophers and gotten. So I'm saying like, look, this is someone who has a pedigree because apparently that mattered in that case. Further, I saw a conversation with you 
on the AI topic where you said, hey, people who aren't experts shouldn't talk about it, which to me sounds like an argument. Did from, I say that? I didn't say that. It's a couple times that was said, no, like, only no, no, no. the experts. And then you said, you're not an expert. Like you admitted that, like, I'm not an expert. So, but well, well, that's I mean, why so, I'm saying it. All right. So now technology, let's count AI as among the rank, among the fruits of technology. There are people who fear that AI will ruin. I'm not among those, but then I'm not an expert. Okay. Hold aside that I've written 50,000 lines of computer code and I've been thinking about computers my whole life. I don't present myself as an expert and I won't. And I say that because people who do present themselves as experts, by the way, I don't count Elon Musk as an AI expert. Yeah, I don't remember saying non-experts shouldn't talk about it. I never, I don't think I would have ever said that. Um, if, or if I did, I, I didn't mean it that way. Um, I, I've coded probably 50,000 lines of computer programs in my life. It was around the time you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and I think about AI all the time. And I interacted with AI as early, what was called AI, as early as the 1970s in a computer science class. Um, we've used AI in my field to analyze data, um, to find interesting things in data that we would not have otherwise been able to sift through. Okay, we've invoked neural nets. So we've been very active in this capacity. Um, and then AI now crosses over into liberal arts and can write your term paper and people lose their shit. So that's intriguing to me that it is so it is so thoroughly embedded elsewhere. And now it touches a place where it hadn't touched before. And people get, now it's in every, you know, every day's newspaper has a scare article on AI. But go on. I just want to, for this conversation, we don't need to rely on whatever other recordings were because you have me in person and I can tell you what I yeah. think. Okay. So go on. Anyhow, Kevin Knuth has articles as well as someone named, I'm just citing their last names without their degrees, Powell, Reilly, Kuhn, Herman Oberth, where they have radar and you can put estimations on the speeds of these. And all they're saying, all these professors, Avi Loeb, even and Gary Nolan, so Stanford, Harvard, people with PhDs in science that may not matter to you, well, Eric let me Weinstein. Say, uh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I, I care, just a sec, just a sec. Um, I, I wasn't clear enough. Um, I, I care that you're professionally trained. Okay. If someone is a professional physicist, medical, I care about that. So do give me that information. I don't care where you got your degree or where you're practicing. The, the, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't care about the perceived prestige of one institution versus another. Okay. That's really what I don't care about, but to, it's nice to know it. Was it a biologist who came up to this? Is Yes. So that's why it's the physicist and, and the philosophers are parted ways. So that mattered to me there because the training is different. Again, I'm, I don't care about pedigree, the pedigree of which institution did the training. I don't care because you spend much more time not in such an institution than in an institution. And so the heights to which you can ascend um, are, are without limits. But, and so, but anyhow, so continue. So you give a list of people and what is, what are you saying about them? What I'm saying is that they're saying, Hey, we would just like more evidence with regard to this. We would like more funding. Good. We would like people to not scorn this subject. So Avi Loeb created the Galileo project and he's getting funding. And so he's off and running. So fine, go ahead. So what, what point are you, what point are you trying to make? I don't know what point you're trying to make. I don't think that skepticism is motivated by rationality. I think skepticism is motivated by the fear of seeming foolish. And that skepticism is associated with intellectualism and conspiracy theories are associated with being unintellectual. So it's a fairly clear cut case for someone who wants to be seen as intellectual. And there's something like a liberalism of ideas like, okay, let's test out different hypotheses. Let's hear what else could be the case. Or there's ostensible intellectualism. And I think that the skeptic will choose what appears highbrow most of the time. That's what I think, because I think they should be encouraging. But how does that apply to all this? So, so what are you saying? I think we're in agreement. We may be using different words. And because it's a charged subject, it sounds like we're arguing, but I, I don't care. Like, I'll hug you if I was to be there in person. Yeah. <laughs> Air hug. Air hug. Yeah. yeah like okay. anyone who's watching me think like, oh, Neil's at Kurt's throat or Kurt's at Neil's throat. No, 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 no. No, it's, it's, it's an animated conversation, as any good conversation should be. Here's something I hear. 
yeah, where's the evidence for this? I'm thinking, where's the evidence for string theory? Where's the evidence that space-time is discrete? There's zero mm -hmm. evidence that space-time is discrete. There are whole programs, whole programs of people wanting it so bad to be discrete. Mm -hmm. Where's the evidence for quantum gravity? Where's the evidence for virtually every single thing that the philosophy department outputs, like we talked about earlier? Mm -hmm. Yet there's millions and millions of churns. Here, it's more money. Here's more money. Here's more money. Take decades if you need to. And then when we talk mm -hmm. about this subject, like there seems to be something so strange going on, which is correlated, by the way. It's not just a jump. This is another sticking point I just want to make clear. I hear that, hey, it's the jump from I don't know what it is to aliens. Maybe it is in the straw man case, like I mentioned, but it's also that. But it's not straw man if half the people say that. It's not a straw man. It's an actual way people think about what they see. And I'm going to assert, because we only just met, but let me assert that I have more access to like people who think this way than you do in your daily life. And it's from that access to people, they, I, I give public talks in a year to, let me say 40, uh, 100,000 people a year I will address in an audience. And I know what they think. I, and we have Q&A. So it, it draws from that. So it's not straw man. To actual what people do. Now we can ignore them and go on to the other cases. I don't have a problem with that. And those other cases are investigated further. And you asked me about funding, and I said Pentagon should spend money on this. So wh what is your argument with me? Th what is your? I said we should spend money. Find out what it is. I, I want to be safe from weird stuff in the skies. So go ahead. Yes, spend money. I would allocate money. There is already is allocated money in the Pentagon. Probably the NSA as well. NASA's allocated money is this SETI in ways that they, they're not supported as much as they used to. But um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we're all there. We're all in on it. So what is your argument against me? I don't get it. What are you trying to say? If what you're saying is, hey, fund these, like we should be searching. There's oddness in the sky. That's fine. As, yes. And that's, and I, and I, I would, I've never not said that. If there's something that's a derisive attitude that can also hold back such studying, by the way, because it places a stigma on it. So they're not disembroiled, they're intertwined. Then that's also an issue. I don't think there's much of a place to be contemptuous toward anyone. And I published I, a book. I published a book a few years ago called Letters from an Astrophysicist. And one of them was someone wrote to me from a skeptics organization, said, what do you make of this? The Pentagon decided to allocate $30 million to study UFOs. That's crazy. And he expected me to just completely resonate with him. And I, this, is, this is now 15 years ago. So some other program that was revealed to have received this money. And I said, pause. $30 million out of $500 billion, or whatever the budget was, is vanishingly small, first of all. Second... If there's something in the sky and we don't know what it is, I want the Pentagon to know about it. I want them to do this research. They didn't say that they're aliens. They just said it's something they don't, UFOs. So I chastised a fellow skeptic for his blind attitude towards the entire subject. And I think I've been pretty consistent about that over my years. I, And so, yeah, I guess I'm most visible in the straw man rebuttal. Yes. But the rest, go for it. And like I said, Avi Loeb is fully funded. He's looking for extraterrestrial asteroids in the Pacific uh -huh. um, right now. Uh -huh. right? It was Galileo Project, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. So, so, yeah. Great, great. Okay. You're trying to argue with me, but I don't have anything to argue with. I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm not trying. Uh, Neil, I hope you okay. don't feel that. <laughs> okay. Let's turn tables and we can come back. I want to ask you about your ability to speak. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing an interview of you. I don't know how long ago, maybe two years ago or so, but I don't know when the interview was from. And you were saying, man, when I went on Jon Stewart, I prepped, I watched his show. I saw how long does he give people to speak? And I thought, okay, let me make sure I can plan my jokes. If I'm going to even have jokes within that time frame, so that they land. And let me think about the cadence and how it plays well with John, something akin to that. So firstly, am I on the right track or am I misremembering? Uh, 
you're basically on the right track, but it's not that I plan my jokes because I'm there to be interviewed for the science. It's his jokes. So uh, once I got the average time that he allows someone to speak before he comedically interrupts, I realized that that's how I should parcel my information so that the information doesn't end up dangling around a joke that, that I have to then resurrect in the next moment I get to speak so that the timing would be smoother if I could parcel my information in those units. And that's what I did. And as a, and it's, it's eight to 15, eight to 12 seconds around there. doesn't sound like much time, but it is in a, in a banter, in a conversation where there's banter, that's actually quite a bit of time. So uh, I did that. Yes. And, and people afterwards, this is one of the earliest interviews that I did with him. Cause I seen people try, especially politicians try to give their stump speech and he's uh. smart and he's clever and he's witty and he's funny. They try to give their stump speech and then he dances circles around them. And, and it's bad. It's embarrassing. I said, I'm not going to be embarrassed that way. All right. And of all the ways I might be embarrassed, I'm going to make sure it's not that way. So I, pra I trained myself in those time units. And after the interview, I had people say, Oh, I saw you on John Stewart. You have such good chemistry with him. Oh, you're such a natural with him. And I said, Oh, I guess it was working. That means it was successful. Yeah, but people think it was natural. And I, I've heard people say, oh, where do you get your gift? As though, okay, yeah, I was just standing there one day on the corner and someone handed it to me and then I opened it and there it was. No, it's it's a denial of, of um, energy, hard the work. Deliberate effort. Yeah. Yeah, it's a denial of that when people say it. I also get there's a, a variant of that is, um, Neil, I just love your Twitter posts. Do you actually write them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, what's wrong with that one? What's wrong with that? Um, it's a, it's a simultaneous compliment and insult. They say they love them. Do I write them? So there's some doubt that whether or not I write uh, them. I see. I see. Because they're so good. Could they have come from you? Correct. Okay. I thought that maybe it's like, they're so good, but you're such a busy person. I don't expect you to write your own tweets. I thought it was that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I don't want to take away your secrets, but can you reveal what are some of the other techniques that you used? Like, I'll give you an instance for me. I did stand up comedy. And when I was doing it, before I did it, I would watch comedians and I would sit there with a pen and paper, much like yourself and think about timing, but also think about what types of jokes and look at the structure like it was a math formula. To the point where when I went on stage for the first time, almost every single person bombs their first time. And I did so well that the guy thought I was doing it for a few months. So that was this huge compliment. It ended up being horrible for me later because I got used to doing okay that when I bombed, I bombed hard and then I just was like, I'm never doing this again. I wasn't prepared for it. But anyhow, I would sit there with a pen and paper and I treated it methodically. So I'm curious, in your early days when you were cultivating this skill, and that's not to say that you're not still sharpening it, what did you do and how did you think about it? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for it. Uh, I First, it matters to me how you think, the person who I'm communicating with. So uh, pop culture awareness for me is paramount because that's a scaffold you walk into the conversation with. And so I don't have to, I, I, I can start there. I can start with something you already care about because by definition, if it's pop culture, you care about it. And so I start there. And if I'm fluent in pop culture, I can clad this scaffold with science and it's attached to something you care about. And you will walk away with a deeper understanding and concern for that and caring for it than you otherwise would if I just put it out there. This is what I have found. Also, I would speak with people in the old days before I was recognized. you still on an airplane. You say, oh, what do you, on long flights. You say, who are you? What do you do? And I say, I do astrophysics and out come the questions. And what's a black hole? How big is the universe? Is there God? They usually save that for last. And I would answer, but monitor their eyebrows or their attention span, or their body language. Are they mm. facing me? Are they facing forward? Mm -hmm. Do they look mm -hmm. away? And I'd make note, not so much with pen and paper, but just... Okay, uh, intuitively. 
intuitively, I, I would make note of what words I used, phrases I invoked, and ideas I conveyed that triggered the greatest interest in the person I was speaking to. And I put that away in my utility belt, right? Also, I've always done writing, always like for 40 years, some form of writing. People generally don't know is practically everything I say publicly, even when interviewed on the news, I have written down previously. If you write it down, it forces you to think about verbs and nouns and and sentence structure. And, and if you're writing in a way that's not a wiki page, if you're writing with some creativity, as you would if you're writing a book, then you're going to care about how the sentence and the phrasing lands as you write it. So when I do this, I have a repository of entire phrases, even words I might use in very specific times and places to maximally communicate with my audience. And that forces me to not be the professor at the front of the room at the chalkboard or the whatever it is to the whiteboard requiring that you meet me 90% of the way to the chalkboard. Well, that's kind of your obligation because you're paying to go to college and I don't have to care whether or not you learn um, because you're paying for it. Right. So uh, what I mean, uh, that sounded really crass, but it's not the professor's obligation to make sure you get a high grade. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you got to meet them 90% of the way to the chalkboard. Whereas I think what I do or what I do when I'm successful is I go 90% of the way to you. Uh It's minimum energy, a minimum lift. When I'm, you just maybe reach out half an arm's length to pull something in. And in that way, you know the, the, the ideas, you feel the ideas, and ideally you take ownership of the ideas so that you never have to reference me again. It's not, this is true because Tyson said so. It's, this is true because here's why. This plugs into that, and this turns that way, but and that's why. And so a big part of what I do is try to teach people how to think. And for those who want more of this, there's actually a master class that I taught for the master class company. And I forgot what it was called, but it was all about this. The link will be on screen as well as in the description. Yeah, the master class is, exclusively about this, the methods, tools, and tactics of communication. I know that you've perhaps covered it in your master class. Is there anything about intonation? Yes. And, yes. And the rhythm of speech. Yes. Yes. So you can think about it. Um, there was a day when letters were handwritten. And as a result, you could write a le- you can write a word in a way that conveys emotions beyond just the word itself. So the word love means something, but maybe it's a little has a little more flourish in it because you're feeling the word. So that's a way we used to communicate when handwriting was there. Then typewriters came in. And so now the way you put letters on the page no longer carried information because it was duplicated perfectly every time. Then we have computers, and now we have texting where we have emojis. Okay, or emoticons and uh, emojis specifically. And instead of saying, I love you in these seven ways, you just put a heart or something. And I think our capacity to communicate with emotional nuance has been systematically thinning uh, over the recent years, especially, but definitely over the decades. When I speak, yes, intonation matters. Monochrome, the person can fatigue on monochrome. A, a monochromatic voice. So yes, there's voice modulation. Also, I used to dance. I was on three performing dance companies in my day, but that sensitized me to what role my body can play in communicating. So no, I'm not just going to stand behind the podium. I'm going to walk around on stage when it's a large space. If the audience is well, I'm going to walk around. I'm going to interact with you in the audience. I'm going to engage you. I'm going to use my arms and my legs and my facial expressions and tone and timbre to communicate in ways that you'll remember more 
because it's not just words on a page or monochromatic speech that's being delivered. Yes, and that's also in the master class. That's also there. And before you go out, do you psych yourself up by saying a phrase or going through a process prior to going on stage? I am so comfortable with going on stage. It's like, let me tell you what my living room looks like. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. Not, there's no. There's no prepping. There's no hyping. There's no ritual. Nothing. Never even in the beginning. Never even because if you're an expert enough at what you're talking about, there's no risk factor. You're not going to embarrass yourself. You're not, you just go out there. And so I see an audience as just someone in my living room and we're just hanging out, sharing notes about the night sky. So yeah, it's, it's, I use every, every part of my physiology that I can to help communicate and to teach. Okay, so let's wrap the discussion on UFOs as much as we can. Now, I don't recall exactly where we were. I was chiding you for trying to declare that I was arguing with you. Okay, I will say, I think what was going on was the whole issue of straw man versus the strongest man. Some people call it the steel man. So I would say that when one is talking about a side or a lane or whatever people are in, and in this case, we're talking about the phenomenon, in quotes, that if one wants to be harmonious and fruitful, that it's useful to first, yeah, you can point out the weakest points, you can acknowledge them, but also to point out the strongest points. It's true. I, I agree. It's a weak point to say, I don't know what it is, therefore it's aliens. At the time, we weren't talking about how weak the point was. We were talking about how many people thought that way. And so <laughs> when I say, uh -huh. when I, when, when I, when I, attack or attack is a harsh word sure, when I, I don't care i don't feel any yeah, no 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 when i when i uh it's when i comment comedically on those who are certain they saw aliens yeah you said oh i'm attacking the straw man and i'm saying i'm addressing the possible majority of what people of what they think and as an educator that matters to me now in a philosophical debate we'll talk about the stronger case the stronger case is someone says the government is stockpiling alien and alien technology, and they've seen it, and it worked to sworn not to talk about it, and they're whistleblower. Okay. Okay. That's not extraordinary evidence. That's no better evidence. It's no better evidence than anybody else sitting in front of Congress talking about what they saw. Yeah, I don't know about that, but I understand what you're saying. So I you, would say... You think it's... You think it's it's enough evidence for you to think that it's real? Really? No. Well, like I was saying, there's smoking gun evidence and then there's increscent evidence. So evidence that moves a needle from 0.5 to 1%. And so rather than having one large sledgehammer... Evidence for what? Evidence that there's something going on in this. No, no. Yes, of course something's going on, either in the detectors and... Uh, yes, of course something is going on. That There's a 100% answer to that. Likelihood of that being true. Yes. The detector could be faulty. There, it could be actual aliens or a sky phenomenon we've never seen before. But if you're going to rank them, if you put aliens at the top, I would question your how in touch with reality you are. If they're if that is your best explanation for what's going on in a world where there's still many mysteries, especially in our detectors. Oh, but this person is high rank and he's a whistleblower. Okay. I bet there's a book out of this. Watch. There's a book. Yeah. And he doesn't have the actual evidence because he has to invoke a cover-up. There it is. I can't keep chasing cover-ups. I don't have the energy for that. If you do, go ahead. I don't. So I don't think that the people who are coming forward as whistleblowers are doing so because I saw an amorphous object in the sky move spasmodically, therefore aliens. They're saying, like, I've seen documents, I've seen photos, I've talked to other people who I trust in any other circumstance with my life, and you would too, because they're your military, and you do trust them with your life. If someone walks into a scientific conference and says, believe this because I saw it, excuse me, we'll show you the back door. Wholeheartedly agree. We, we have, we have, we have stronger. Neil. We, we, hold on. We have stronger constraints on your reporting of evidence for much less of a claim. Then what's going on here? You cannot expect an authentic, an authentic practicing scientist 
to see that practicing scientist to see that as evidence of aliens. Yeah. So evidence of something fine. Evidence of aliens that have visited. I need better evidence like the alien. That would be really helpful. Okay. This is what I mean by it needs to not be a straw man because the people, at least that I've seen are not saying, and because of this, you should believe it's aliens, nor are they saying that I believe I, as in them, sorry, I'm quoting, I don't believe it's aliens necessarily. Like they would say that and they would say, I don't expect you to believe anything. I'm just saying, this is what I saw. Can we please get some congressional hearings on this? Can you please petition your government? Can you please look at the skies more? I don't know, fund Avi Loeb. That's the only project for something that seems to be this, like there's SETI as well, but it's not of the same sort. Then that's a bit odd because millions of people are interested fun in this. SETI. Go ahead and fund SETI. We're looking all the time. We have people all with telescopes, the Allen Telescope Array in Northern California. I think it's in Northern California. Yeah, fund SETI. Go ahead. To me, the strongest view is like, hey, there- What's strongest of what? The strongest the view, the strongest view on this subject is that, hey, there's some competent, diligent people who- Again, I would trust with my life and they could be mistaken. They could also be on to something when they say that there's something extraordinary. So please let's investigate. And furthermore, there are people like Kevin Knuth who can put accelerational bounds from the radar data, which is in journals published. So please let's investigate these anomalies. And I would conclude with that. Uh, didn't I say let's investigate? Yes, yes. So what, oh, so, so what's your point? My point is that that's not the impression that people have of your commentary on this subject. Because they talk about aliens. That's what they ask me about. And that's what I refer to. That it's We're not talking about just stuff we don't understand. They'd say it's aliens visiting because it's doing physics that we don't understand. It's gotta be aliens. They're, they're coming and the government is keeping it a secret because they think if they tell us the truth, we'll all freak out. This is what I get when I'm in the public. You, If you stepped out in the public speaking this way, you'll get that too. Apparently, you don't have the same data I have about what interests people and what they're asking out of me. But in those interviews, I do say I want to meet the aliens. Yes. Okay, so there are a couple issues here, and I just want to wrap this up. Number one, I don't get that same sort of impression. I come with me to the 100,000 people I speak to a year, and you will. Okay? Come with so me. So that could be I have a bias set, or it could yes. be you have a oh, bias you... set. And really? Could... Okay. <laughs> No, I'm saying like it could be a combination of both because maybe the interviewers who are setting you up want to set you up with people who are likely to elicit a certain response. And so they, it could be that. It could also be you recall a certain type of people more because they stand out more rather than the more cogent kind who just okay. tends to go This under. is the wrong subject for you to justify your disagreement with me by suggesting I might be biased. That is the, pick a different subject where I could be biased. Not this one. What I mean no. is that I'm not saying you're biased. No. I'm saying that there's I have I have I have 30 years of email correspondence with people who are coming. Okay. I, I wrote a book called Letters from an Astro when an entire chapter of it was people commenting on shit they saw in the sky. Okay. So 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 to for you to feel comfortable thinking what you think is true by saying my data set is biased. This is the wrong example. It's the wrong ring to, 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 to ring that bell in. I think I said it could be that. And if I didn't, then I apologize because it could be. <laughs> no. And like you mentioned, like anyone should admit that there's bias in virtually whatever we do. So there could be but bias here. But it could be yes, but it's not, it's not binary. There's shades of bias that go from full bias to near zero bias. Okay. And to say everyone has bias, therefore you can't believe anything? No. I didn't say okay. that. Okay. I know you don't think I said that, but I understand. Okay. Okay. Again, I don't know if in that book with that chapter that it's of the sort, like I saw a blurry object that moved erratically, thus aliens. I think that it would be more nuanced than that. They ask me, is it aliens? That's what they say every time. Every time. Well, every that sounds time. like a question. That, not, that's is it not just bad. some new mystery that, of the universe? Nothing... It lands on aliens every time. But there's nothing wrong with asking a question like that. There like, isn't. That's why I put it in the book and it has a very respectful answer. Yes, it's in the book. I do this. Don't you don't you know what I do in a day? How many people I interact with? Who I interact with? Okay. So, the guy is the whistleblower, like I said that alone is a is clickbait. The whistleblower says these things. Fine. Let's investigate them. But 
that if he was had much less of a thing to announce to the world and he tried to bring that to a scientific conference we wouldn't we, that's not how you do it and no he doesn't have good enough scientific evidence to convince a scientific skeptic he, he doesn't because he's it's basically eyewitness testimony at this point and so yeah if he's onto something yeah investigate it yeah okay great i like that i agree with that last part well i've been saying that for an hour <laughs> <laughs> I understand what I was talking about was that there's an impression. Then we talked about the impression. I, I agree. Pe I, I agree. People get that impression. I agree. People can get that impression. Um, and because it's more quotable to quote me saying, um, make mock mocking the idea that we've been invaded by aliens and they only show up in government agencies. That's a way funner internet quote then yes let's investigate what we don't know i want the government to protect me from hazards in the sky yeah it's so to turn the tables on myself i have a bias set and maybe the people who are listening have a bias set because only what is clickbait of you saying something negative gets shared and when you say something that's neutral positive correct it's not something people want to watch and so they may have a different impression of you and if not you others who are philosophically leaning have a bias against me and my views on philosophy. I have very precise views on philosophy. I had a hundred, maybe dozens of philosophers in a philosophy blog criticize a comedic comment I made on a comedic podcast to a host who majored in philosophy and then switched. And I made some comedic joke about it. And then they all piled on me, defending their field, thinking I thought their field should not go away. Meanwhile, I gave a four-minute account of my more nuanced views of philosophy in a public forum with, with Richard Dawkins on stage in a university venue, which is also on the internet, and none of those people referenced that quote. None of them. Okay? It was like they had this little 30-second clickbait, and I'm a big target, right? So they mm. all passed it among themselves. He's like, look, Dyson is an idiot about philosophy. He doesn't know the foundations of philosophy. Gosh. So, so you should be me for a day, and you'll see what's, what's going on here. And the more nuanced is, the nuanced point is, people trained in the 20th century in the era of modern physics, purely in philosophy, have not found themselves to be as relevant or as helpful to the point of being not helpful at all in the moving frontier of the physical sciences relative to what it was in all previous centuries, period. I, I stick by that. And, and that point came out earlier in this conversation. And you were going to give me the best example and you mentioned Aristotle. Plus, he's kind of a bad example with regard to physics. He got most of his physics wrong. So, so <laughs> you can probably do better than Aristotle in the physical sciences. Yeah, it's a myth that Aristotle thought that heavier bodies fall faster. No, it's not. No, I read his writings. No. It's mistranslated. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, excuse me. No, I have his writings. No, no. Okay, it says... Uh, uh, well, I'll uh, tell you, he's talking about terminal velocity versus another kind of velocity. And it just gets translated as all saying velocity. And then there's something no, else. No, no, that's not what, I, it's not what I read. What I read was, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the sense of it was, um, uh, heavier objects will fall faster than lighter objects in proportion to how heavy they are. That statement was made by Aristotle. Uh -huh. And that is not purely related to terminal velocity. Okay. That's somebody who never did the experiment. Yeah. Well, I, I don't believe you that I don't understand what he meant in that sentence or in that, in that part, maybe he writ, wrote different things in other places. Okay. But I've read, I, I can't say I've read all of Aristotle. All right. But what I did read included that, that phrase. You try to defend him and the, the, just, he's dead. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <He's trying. laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, okay. I will, I'll and send I gotta you. Go. I can't, I gotta, I gotta, 
Oh, you want to do some AI right now? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, I'll send you a video about that because this is by Richard Borchards. A, a video, video about what? About Aristotle and the and the misquotes and the mistranslations that make him sound foolish when when he he was no fool and he wouldn't make a simple mistake like that. And he also did experimental science in like a super early form of it. And okay, so it's not if I'm a, wrong, yeah. I, I want to know that I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay, so if you send me this video, sure. and I'll compare it to the writings that I have of his, uh, no, because I have and to the say, I didn't short. the video short. So yeah. I, I didn't read the original Greek. Okay, so I, so I am reading a translation, um, but there's no way I can see terminal velocity being relevant to that translation. But if I'm wrong, I will correct it, and in any occasion where I might have said something about it, I will say that I was wrong. And I could be, and I could be wrong, and I'm likely wrong because I'm wrong about almost everything I say. So no. <laughs> But I just know that there's an Aristotle fan club where he can do no wrong in their eyes. And that comes along with a certain bias uh, uh -huh. that manifests. I've seen that. Yeah. Way. Okay. I don't, I don't know if, I don't think I'm a part of that fan club. Okay. But. If we think Aristotle made a statement that an eight-year-old can see as wrong in three seconds, then just maybe Aristotle didn't actually make that statement, or maybe we misunderstood or something. Not only is it stupid to believe that freely falling bodies fall at a speed proportion to their weight, but it's also stupid to believe that Aristotle thought this. The um, idea that Aristotle made this claim is just nonsense. So it's a problem of mistranslation. The words that Aristotle used, like speed or force, don't have exactly the same meanings to Aristotle as they do to us. I know this is an odd question, and I didn't have a specific one planned. I didn't actually think we would get this far, but I wanted to hear. Like, I know that you believe that there is fear-mongering over AI. I don't believe anything. It's not, don't say I believe anything. It might be things I've said, but go ahead, go ahead, go, go. Do you believe you don't believe anything? <laughs> uh, I apportion what I think is true based on the quality and quantity of evidence in support of it. So and that for that reason, I probably believe fewer things than most people who were ever born. I mean this in a nice way, Neil. I think that means that you don't have an understanding of, well, I don't know, that sounds mean. What I was going to say be is mean. that- You could be mean. Everyone, including me and you, are irrational and act based on social cues and unconscious primers to the core to suggest that you don't have beliefs or that all of your information is rationally evaluated before being accepted is more a demonstration of a lack of self-awareness than deduction. And I mean that kind of... No, 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 I didn't say I'd have... I, I, all I said was, what I think is true is measured by the evidence in support of it. Uh -huh. And to the extent that there's less evidence, I will have less confidence in it being true. I don't like using the word belief in that uh. context because belief means something in our modern culture. Belief is often religious and there's a thing that you believe is true in the absence of evidence. I don't run around in the absence of evidence saying things are true, such as what is prevalent in almost every religion in the world and some other and some cults and some other belief systems. So that's why I I, I don't say what I believe. It's not a thing. It's not. So would you say what do you word. think, or you say like what is the word you use in replace in place of that? In place of what? Belief. Like I don't believe the earth. I've never is. said that. I don't. I don't construct sentences like that. That's not you how just I say speak. the earth is. Yes. If we, if we know it, I'll say what it is. If we don't know it, we'll say we think it's this, but we're not sure. Uh -huh. We have top people working on it. Okay. Uh, is there a multiverse? Maybe. We don't know. We don't have evidence. We have top people working on it. It's a natural consequence of general relativity and quantum physics applied in the early universe. So we'll see how that develops. That's an entire sentence without using the word believe. It's not about belief. Not in the way the word is presently used in modern parlance. And and I, and I so I'm going to say the sentence with the word belief because I don't know how to phrase it. Okay, but go ahead. You can go translate ahead. it. I, I was just jumping on you, but yeah. Do you believe that the current tenor about AI is fear mongering, and if so, what about it is? The phrase fear mongering often means that it's overblown, and so I I think the people who are sounding the call deeply believe what they're saying, so they're not mongering in that sense fear mongering if i understand the word mongering so sure um i i believe that they believe that 
Uh, I don't agree with the extent to which they predict apocalypse from AI based on my own life experience, interacting with computers, thinking about the problem. So my take on it is softer than theirs. Uh, so, but a warning about an apocalyptic future can never be bad if it sensitizes you to what could go wrong. Uh, such as, uh, did I say earlier? I don't remember uh, the quote from Ray Bradbury. No. When his author, when his when one of his fans came up and said, why do you write future sci-fi stories that uh, depict apocalypse? Okay. Do, is that what you think the future of civilization will be? And he says, no, I write about it so that you know to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I like that. So, so I'll warn you about an asteroid that has a one in a million chance of striking. And I'll give a very detailed description of what would happen to Earth were that to occur in my fear mongering i can i'll say it's only one in a million chance but what kind of chance do you want to take you bet on the lottery with a lesser chance than that that you'll win that you freely hand money to the state so i'll make some comparisons of risks but um it's my duty to tell people because i know the the parameters of the risk of asteroid strikes uh -huh. being an astrophysicist uh -huh. so in that sense, yeah, I'd be warning people. Cl climate change people are giving the warnings. You give the most dire warnings. Um, and one of the big problems there is what was originally considered dire are now becoming more mainstream in the in the pace at which climate is changing and not in our favor. So, yeah, I don't think they think they're mongering. But personally, I think we're not necessarily headed on that path. But it's a warning shot across our bow, and I think it should be heated. Okay, that's good to know. So you know how NASA, or I think it's NASA, you, you could tell me, it observes the sky to see to rule out asteroids of a certain size. Um, there was a there was a, there was an asteroid search program to catalog all asteroids greater than a kilometer and then greater than a hundred meters. Mm -hmm. So it's much okay. harder the smaller they get; they're not yeah. as bright and but there are many more of them. So the total risk can even be higher from the smaller ones than from the larger ones. But yes. What I wanted to know is, does that bound keep lowering every five years or so? You know, there's Moore's law for computing. Like, is there something similar for we're able to now detect half a kilometer and now 10 years later, we'll be able to detect half of that 10 years. Yeah, from so that. it's, a, it's a little, yes, but it's a little more subtle than that. It's, it's, we can already detect asteroids that small the question is how complete is the catalog of them and there are ways to make that estimate but so it's not so much a detection limit as a completeness limit and so yeah i don't know what we're down to now but i do know that this latest telescope that comes online i think later this year if not already the vera rubin space telescope originally named the large synoptic survey telescope that is exquisitely conceived and designed to detect asteroids mm. because it basically takes a it gets it takes a movie of the night sky every night and you need more than one image to see if something's moving so a movie you see anything that's moving and a big challenge there are all of these satellites that are getting launched especially starlink and others that are just completely contaminating the sky and you don't want things contaminating what could be the detection of an asteroid because you missed it because there was a can you just send out your satellite? No, this telescope is huge. No, no, no. Oh, it's on this the Earth. It's huge. Yeah, it's on Earth. Yeah, it's huge. It's 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 going to image. I forgot the numbers. Something like half the sky every night or something, and then repeat that. And then there's some AI that goes in and decides whether something is interesting. Something has changed. It tells us. It, it forms another telescope to follow up on it. So there's a lot of automation involved here that we've learned how to master over recent decades, but. Um, that that's a telescope that could bring that limit lower. Okay, we'll end on a question of probability. What number do you assign that those blurry objects are indeed aliens or something out of this world, let's just say? That there's something extraterrestrial? Yeah. Uh, I would say, uh, I'm not a probability guy, but I would say... Uh, Less than 
I would say less than one one hundred thousandth of one percent. Okay. So I'm okay. And where do I get that number? Um, there's surely a m- millions of sightings of these things. And I don't, I'm not convinced that any of them are aliens. And so my percent has to be lower than that. Right. So I'm actually coming up calculating what number this would be. So I have to be lower than all the sightings that have been reported and all, cause I don't, I don't think any of those are aliens. I find it highly unlikely that they are, I should say. And so is it one, 100,000th of 1%? So that's, um, one out of 10 million chance it's extraterrestrial. So what would convince you that it was extraterrestrial? You show alien, bring out the alien, bring out the space, put it in town square. Okay. Have people high resolution. I, I could give a whole list okay, okay. of things. Okay. All I could right. give an entire list. Oh, by the way, video, because, because AI can make deep fake video, it's going to video of aliens will be, will be a starting point, but not an ending point as evidence for aliens, just because of the capacity to make a deep fake. And that we have Hollywood, you know, over on the West coast. So I would, um, I, I would say artifacts of alien manufacturing. Yes. Or the alien itself. Yeah. Yeah. So then that means that if I was to say, Hey, Neil, you put up $100,000. Okay. No, I, don't I, will, money I will, this. I will put up $10 because then that means you have drastic, drastic, drastic odds in your favor. If it's one hundredth of 1%, then my $10 to your $100,000. Oh, I said one one hundred thousandth of, uh, I, no, yeah, my numbers are, yeah, yeah, it's still, it's still steep. It's still, you're in the right zone. Yes. Okay. You're getting a 10 to one, if not 1000 to one return. So if I was to put up Fifty dollars. I'll say I'll put up fifty dollars over the next fifteen years to your one hundred thousand dollars. That should be a bet that you're like, I will sign it right now. Let's do it, brother. That would mean if we find alien, if wait, 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 wait. You want me to bet against future? I'm betting against what we've already seen. That these are different things. Okay, okay. fine. Then what we've seen gets revealed to be aliens. Okay. Yeah, so that's where my statistic comes from. I, the chances that so now, so now you want one hundred thousand to fifty thousand to fifty. Sure, you say. So that would mean that if it's aliens, I, I give would say one hundred thousand to fifty. But okay, that means if it's aliens, I give you one hundred thousand dollars. Yes. If it's not aliens, you give me fifty dollars. Yes. <laughs> and that should still be wildly, wildly in your favor. Yeah, but I, I don't, I don't bet money. I don't bet. It's not what I do. Do you know that the American Physical Society had a meeting in Las Vegas? Sorry, they were going to meet in San Diego, but there's a hotel snafu. This is the, the world's physicist, the, the country's physicist. So G- MGM Grand said, we'll take you. The MGM uh, Marina Hotel, it was at the time, in, in the 80s. And so they all go to Vegas, 3,000, 4,000 physicists. At the end of the week, there was a newspaper headline, physicists in town, lowest casino take ever. Just don't bet. When you know statistics, but you're saying I should bet because it's in my favor. That's drastically a thousand yeah. times in your favor. Yeah, I, I don't put money on it. I'm not a money guy in that way. All right, Neil. Neil, what are you working on next? Where can how about this? Find why, out- why don't we make this? If you want to do this officially, how about this? Um, how about this? Just because it's it's all in fun, right? So we, should, we shouldn't change each other's lifestyles on the bet. So how about this? Uh, is it within the next 10 years, something that has already been cited show, turns out to be alien, okay? I'll give you $100. If it's not, you give me a penny. How about that? Uh, all right, but with inflation. It's a ratio. What are you talking about? It's a ra- It's a ratio. Okay, so my penny with inflation then, and your 100 with inflation. No, it's just a ratio. That's all we're capturing here. Inflation keeps the same ratio. What, what's the difference? I mean, I, it's a ratio bet. $100 to a penny, that's t- a ratio of 10,000, correct? Yeah. That's 10. No, no. 
Is that right? A hundred thousand? No, that's 10,000. hundred times a hundred is 10,000. Right? A hundred dollars is 10,000 times more than a penny. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you a penny if there's actual aliens. And that knowledge would be r- way greater than a penny's worth, of course. You mean you'll <laughs> give me a hundred, but yeah, yeah. No, no, sorry. So I, I'd give you a hundred. Yeah. No, no. No, yes. I give you a hundred. You give me a penny. Yes. I saw I said it backwards. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. There you go. Okay. Within how much time? Within 10 years. And we have to allow, like, it has to be asterisked with that. Something new may be revealed and we can always bicker and say, yeah, but that's n- totally new. But it, then several people will be like, no, no it has no, to be about something that's already been spotted. It has to be about the history of all observations of crazy things in the sky. All right, whatever. We'll work out the details. <laughs> Our lawyers will speak to each no. other. <laughs> the lawyers cost more than the value of this bet. Right. All right, man. It was great talking with you. And again, where can people find out more about you? And what are you working on next? And what are you excited about working on next? Oh, just my website, neildegrassetyson.com. And all my stuff is there in my postings. And and on and on and on on uh, uh, social media, it's Neil deGrasse Tyson everywhere except Twitter. Where, where space is a premium. So there's just Neil Tyson there on Twitter. I'm pretty, I'm relatively active in that space. Those space. And my podcast, Start Talk, yeah. it's, it brings the science down to earth. Uh-huh. Whoever will listen. We have comedy. There's a comedic element to it. There's pop culture. If you just want to have fun learning science, it's a good place. What are you exploring next on that podcast that you're most excited about? Oh, uh, no, no. It's just every episode is different. And... Uh, it's, it's it's not some theme thing that runs multiple episodes. It get, it gets pretty random. We spoke with an AI person about uh, AI coaches and sports. Would they perform a regular coach? Um, we spoke with uh, a person who's an expert on dead people, and we learned about forensics there. So uh, science of all kinds, not just, of course, the universe. I see. So, yeah. Okay, Neil, thank you, and I appreciate how cordial you were despite the contentious nature and i hope you detect that i come from a good place and honestly i'm having fun when you get angry oh no, <laughs> and, i'm not angry i'm just I, I'm, I'm emoting I'm, I'm 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 passionate is the word yeah okay well i'm having i'm never angry about any of this i have right. my own fervor when you get passionate so okay i appreciate it and all right and we'll talk again Take good care, luck that thanks bye Thank you for watching this two hour or almost two and a half hour, maybe more length of a podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I assume you have as you're watching all the way till the end. I always leave podcasts without commentary. I just post it up as is, but I thought I'd close with some clarification. It was a bit difficult because we both felt as if the other was putting words in the other's mouth. And that's my fault. Number one, because I should be more careful with the words that I speak, especially if it's instigating a certain reaction from Neil consistently. If I get that from anyone two or three or four times in a row, there's something wrong with how I'm communicating. And so I regret that. And Neil, I want you to know that if you're watching this, I would do it differently if I could. Number two, and I have some notes here. I didn't get to state this as it's a bit tricky to do so. You may not know this, but Neil is a titan and it's extremely arduous to get a word in because unless I'm going to mute his microphone, it's just extremely tough. So the point I wanted to say that I don't think I got across is that there are people who come forward with claims of being a whistleblower and they have zero tangible evidence other than their word and perhaps the title, that is their employment history. But sometimes we believe them because it comports with what else we believe. For instance, if someone comes out from Facebook and says that there's some improprieties there for reasons X, Y, and Z, and that they were a part of some committee where this was revealed, but they have zero evidence, we're more inclined to believe them because it's something that's ordinary. We expect that from Facebook. It's not extraordinary. And then there's this phrase that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, which is actually somewhat debunkable because it's not as if there's a separate class of evidence called extraordinary evidence. Let me just get my extraordinary evidence now. Brian Keating talks about this. Regardless, the statement on Neil's part is that he wants people who are making large claims to come forward with evidence. And I'd like that as well. You would like that as well. We don't imagine that you're allowed to bring your cell phone and take pictures of classified government documents or a spacecraft if you were to encounter it and then leave with it. I also imagine that the people who come forward with a high probability believe that they're going to be mocked by someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson for exactly the reason of coming forward without evidence. However, they also feel like if they don't come forward, 
other people won't come forward. So it's a nurse crop issue. The people who are providing no evidence but plenty of claims, along with perhaps an employment record to go along with it, are doing so in part so that others can come forward, and in doing so, engendering the conditions where others can come forward with evidence, or so that the body politic can petition for said evidence. When people like Neil make some glib and disparaging remarks like, hey, why don't you film your abduction, they squash that nurse crop in the bud, making it less likely that people will come forward. And by the way, this isn't an exclusively UFO issue. It's an issue that characterizes grave situations in general, whether it's abuse or trafficking. So if Neil indeed wants to know about the evidence for UFOs, like I've heard him say that he'd be the first in line to want that evidence about aliens. Firstly, I don't believe that. I'm sorry. Once you put a stake in the ground against some result, almost none of us are eager to contravene our former self, especially not publicly. But anyhow, if Neil wants to know about the existence of aliens, then I would say, Neil, please temper your snideness and your sarcasm with regard to saying, hey, people who encounter these beings or have some visions or whatever it may be need to have some evidence of it, some photographic evidence. By the way, people who feel, at least feel like they've been through some experience like that, find it extremely dismaying and traumatic. So I'm not a huge fan of statements like that. However, in Neil's defense, Neil has frequently said, go ahead, search for the evidence. In fact, I think way more money, way more money should be given to the search for extraterrestrial life. Whether it's the Galileo project, whether it's some other project, whether it's SETI, Neil is in favor of allocating money toward that issue. Those clips don't go viral. And this means it's my bias that I see those inimical clips of him with sarcasm. And that needs to be known. Firstly, I need to say it more to myself just to believe it because I haven't seen many of those clips, but also to you because I'm sure you haven't seen them as the algorithm just doesn't feed them. Again, to reiterate, Neil is in favor of more money being given to uncover the truth about UAPs. Anyhow, thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day and that you have a great sleep. If this is near nighttime, good day or good night whenever you're hearing this. Thank you. Take care. The podcast is now concluded. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed or clicked that like button, now would be a great time to do so as each subscribe and like helps you to push this content to more people. You should also know that there's a remarkably active Discord and subreddit for Theories of Everything where people explicate toes, disagree respectfully about theories, and build as a community our own toes. Links to both are in the description. Also, I recently found out that external links count plenty toward the algorithm, which means that when you share on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit, etc., it shows YouTube that people are talking about this outside of YouTube, which in turn greatly aids the distribution on YouTube as well. Last but not least, you should know that this podcast is on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on every one of the audio platforms. Just type in theories of everything and you'll find it. Often I gain from re-watching lectures and podcasts, and I read that in the comments, hey, toll listeners also gain from replaying. So how about instead re-listening on those platforms? iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whichever podcast catcher you use. If you'd like to support more conversations like this, then do consider visiting patreon.com slash Kurt Jimungle and donating with whatever you like. Again, it's support from the sponsors and you that allow me to work on Toe full time. You get early access to ad free audio episodes there as well. For instance, this episode was released a few days earlier. Every dollar helps far more than you think. Either way, your viewership is generosity enough.